Hello, everyone. We have almost 3,000 registered for this event tonight, so I would like to extend a welcome to those that are joining us from around the world. Um, as Sarah said, I am Sue Cowan and the CEO of Crohn's and Colitis Canada. I want to wish everyone a happy new year and uh, here's to a much brighter 2021 for all of us. Like you, I am personally impacted by IBD. Our son lives with ulcerative colitis. I understand the issues these unpredictable diseases bring and the heightened concerns that have emerged with the onset of COVID. We are so grateful for all the people and organizations that have come together to help the IBD community. We truly appreciate the support received from volunteers, donors, organizations, researchers, and healthcare providers in helping us get through a very tough year. Because of you, we were able to sustain important research work and award five new research grants. Because of you, we can continue delivering programs like these webinars. We are looking ahead with great hope. As CEO, I have the honor of continuing to support the mission that started in 1974 with a promise that we would find the cure for these devastating diseases and improve lives. Crohn's and Colitis Canada believes deeply in our mission to cure Crohn's and colitis and to improve the quality of life of everyone affected by these chronic diseases. We are working hard to support you with the information, resources, and through critical research. And together, we've made many advances towards this goal. Tonight is our 21st webinar. Um, we will continue to host these webinars as long as you need us to do so. As always, this information and the webinar recordings can be accessed on our website at Crohn'sandcolitis.ca. I want to make sure we give a huge thank you to our task force who continues to meet to discuss policies and recommendations necessary for our community. Thank you to today's panelists, Dr. Cynthia So and Dr. Charles Bernstein. I know this will be a very interesting and timely discussion on vaccines. And of course, um, much appreciation to our fantastic mon moderators, Dr. Gil Kaplan, Professor of Medicine, University of Calgary, adult gastroenterologist and epidemiologist, past chair of the Scientific Medical Advisory Council, and also Dar uh, Dr. Eric Benchamal, Professor and Pediatric Gastroenterologist at the Hospital for Sick Children and University of Toronto, Chair of the Scientific Medical Advisory Council, as well as a Crohn's and Colitis Canada Board Director. Yesterday was Eric's birthday, so a belated happy birthday from all of us as well. Um, thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. Very best wishes to you and your families. And then in these times of COVID, I will leave you with the message, think positive and stay negative. I'll now pass it over to Gil and Eric. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Sue. So and did Eric, anything happen? Oh, thank you. And Happy New Year. Did okay. anything happen over the past few weeks? I don't, uh, it was pretty quiet, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My son had a birthday on Monday too, just like just like yours. It was a Zoom birthday, first time uh, for. Um, but yeah, no, no, things have been crazy. I can't like the last webinar we did back on December seventeenth. You know that was actually on vaccines as well. And just to think about how intense the world has moved just in these past four weeks. Um, you know we're here back updating our vaccine recommendations, guidelines, and, and discussions here. Um, again, it's just it's been a crazy whirlwind. It has, it has, and uh, I was fortunate enough to get my first dose of the uh, COVID vaccine uh, a couple weeks ago, I guess now. Uh, so I'm very grateful for that. I know I think you're still waiting for your first dose, right? Or you're about to get it? But, yeah, so uh, I was close to, and then and then the, with the Pfizer cutbacks, um, they've kind of put a pause on first dose vaccines. So just, yeah. uh, I was on call at the Foothills Hospital this past weekend, so just being extra careful, wearing PPE, and luckily I haven't been exposed to COVID today. Yeah, and of course life doesn't really change after you get that first vaccine. I'm certainly grateful and I'm hoping this helps protect my patients, but um, you know, we still have to protect ourselves. We're not completely protected. Even when you get both doses of vaccine, it's only 95% effective. So while COVID is still raging out there and there's still very, very high numbers, we have to be very careful. But hopefully, you know, there's a light at the end of the tunnel and hopefully by the summer or early fall, we may start to be getting back out there and uh, living an almost normal life, I hope. 
Yeah, and then and then exactly. So what we're going to do is I'm going to take over control of the presentation here, and I'm actually going to start by just talking about the mRNA vaccine, just to give of a general overview of where things are at right now, um, and then we're going to bring Eric back afterwards to talk about the new recommendations from Crohn's and Clays Canada, and to talk to you about what other parts of the country are and the world are doing as well. And so, um, you know, this is a, a slide. I just want to start by thanking. Uh, Joseph Windsor, who's actually a, a employee of mine in, in my research lab, who put together this slide and is tracking this data. Um, and, um, you, you know, you can kind of see where things have gone in the past year. And after living through the first wave of the pandemic during the spring of 2020, we, we saw, you know, that first wave. And then the summer saw cases starting to level off and be lower. But unfortunately, as everyone knows, over the past few months, we've observed rising cases of COVID in Canada and throughout the world, including in the IBD community. Um, there are more cases today than during the peak in the first wave. Uh, we're still in the upswing of the second wave and there's no clear idea when it's gonna end. Uh, through 21 webinars that we've done since March 19th, we've seen cases of COVID in the world grow from 230,000 people on March 19th to over 97 million people who have been diagnosed with COVID today. On March 19th, there were 782 Canadians with COVID, and today over 725,000 have. The Secure IBD Registry is an international database of individuals with IBD who have tested positive for COVID. On March 19th, we had reported 21 patients with IBD in that database. Today, there are over 4,500 cases. This graph shows the daily number of cases of COVID diagnosed over the past year in Canada. During the first wave of the pandemic, between March and May, daily cases were exceeding around 1,500 diagnoses a day. Through the summer, those daily cases of COVID waned, but have subsequently picked up dramatically during the fall and through the winter. Uh, over 8,000 cases a day being reported across Canada uh, in early January. Driving this number down will depend on what we do as a collective over the next few weeks and how quickly Canadians can be vaccinated for COVID-19. So I just want to start by answering the question, what, what are these mRNA vaccines? Uh, these are novel vaccines that were completely different from the traditional vaccines that inject either um, a diluted virus or a protein of the virus. mRNA vaccines target the spike protein that sits on the surface of the virus. Scientists have isolated the genetic sequence for the virus spike protein and synthesized its mRNA sequence. And that provides instructions that cells use to make the spike protein. The synthetic mRNA is packaged in a lipid nanoparticle, and that delivers the mRNA instructions to a cell. Once inside the cell, its cellular machinery follows the mRNA instructions to produce the viral protein. This is displayed on the surface of the cell and stimulates an immune response. So the mRNA vaccines are roughly 95% effective. So what does that 95% effective vaccine mean? Um, so I just want to give you an example from the Moderna randomized control studies. Uh, the mRNA vaccine was given to 15,000 people and five of them developed COVID-19, but none were seriously ill. Another 15,000 were given the placebo shot, 90 of them developed COVID, 11 being seriously ill. So what about um, serious side effects of, of the vaccine? So the most commonly reported adverse reactions include injection site pain, fatigue, headache, a sore muscle, some fevers, there have been very few reported cases of anaphylaxis, which at Canadian vaccination sites can be treated immediately by the medical personnel present. So a really important question is, does a vaccine stop COVID-19 altogether? So the randomized control studies have shown that vaccines reduce symptomatic COVID-19. However, studies are still ongoing to determine the ability of these vaccines to prevent the transmission of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. In the meantime, public health measures such as using face masks, physical distancing, and hand hygiene remain essential. We've also talked a lot about these genetic variants you've heard in the news. So genetic variants of SARS-CoV-2 are emerging and they require continuous monitoring of the COVID-19 vaccine performance over time. Reassuringly, the available data suggests that the mRNA elicits cross-neutralizing activity against these genetic variants that differ from the original vaccine strain. In other words, there is a high likelihood that the current vaccines will protect us from these new mutations of the virus that we're seeing today. So this is a map of the world showing the countries that have started vaccinating their populations. 
Among the 52 countries, over 53 million doses have been administered between December 14th, 2020 and January 21st, 2021. This is the distribution of vaccines administered across Canada, showing the number of people with at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. Over 670,000 Canadians have received at least one dose of the vaccine, representing a national average of roughly 1.9% of the population. This map highlights that achieving high vaccination coverage across Canada is expected to take time, likely not till the fall of 2021. In the early months of the vaccination programs, we're also dealing with shortages of vaccines as manufacturing plants are desperately producing vaccines at staggering paces. Since the vaccines were approved in December, more than 50 million, 50 million doses have already been shipped globally, and Pfizer alone is on track to produce 1.3 billion doses in 2021. However, as everyone knows, recent announcements from Pfizer have noted that the supply of the vaccines are currently on hold in Canada for the next few weeks, weeks while they upgrade their manufacturing plant. And this reminds us how vulnerable the vaccine supply is in Canada. So what is being done to account for vaccine shortages across the world, and in particular in Canada? Well, first, everywhere is prioritizing the sequence of administering vaccines. Most health authorities are prioritizing vaccines based on the risk of exposure and the risk of complications. High on the priority list are frontline healthcare workers with high exposure risks and working in vital areas within the health system. Take for example, intensive care unit doctors and nurses. They were, in first, they were first in line because they were at high risk of exposure from their critically ill patients with COVID, but also because there's so few highly trained intensivists that a large scale illness could crumble that vital health system, the ICU. Similarly, individuals who are at high risk of dying from COVID-19, specifically residents of long-term care are being prioritized right now. Additionally, individuals who work in those long-term care facilities are prioritized in order to prevent them from spreading COVID-19 to these vulnerable populations. Now with time, we'll see more healthcare workers vaccinated and programs are gonna to start to introduce people who are over the age of 75 and those with other comorbidities. Now, another option being considered about, these, uh, about optimizing the vaccine is extending the timing of the second shot of the vaccine. So we've heard this um, probably in the news, many of you probably heard of people or different jurisdictions thinking about doing that. And the rationale for this is that this is a figure from the randomized controlled trial in the New England Journal of Medicine paper um, that showed us the effectiveness of the mRNA vaccine was apparent after about 10 to 14 days from the administration of the first dose. And these findings have led some public health authorities to consider delaying administration of a second dose to maximize the number of people receiving the first immunization. However, there are no clinical data at present that would confirm prolonged protection after a first dose beyond the intervals studied in these trials. So it makes regulatory approval extending a dosing interval very challenging and it potentially could be associated um, with some mistakes and potentially even um, being under vaccinated. And so for the most part, this means that most Canadians are continuing to wait for their vaccine until the supply and distribution of vaccines rapidly escalate over time. So what does that mean for most people in the audience? Well, you're waiting to become eligible for vaccination. And while you're waiting, reach out to your gastroenterologist, reach out to your primary care physician and start a dialogue about vaccination. So you're ready when your turn comes up. I just wanna share with you a letter that the University of Calgary's IBD clinic created for our patients with IBD. The letter can be provided to vaccine administration sites and states, um, and the following, I'm just quoting it, it's a shared decision between myself and my patient after a risk assessment, and we feel that the risk of COVID-19 infection outweighs the potential risk of vaccination. So we request a complete series of COVID-19 vaccine being administered. And so why am I and many of my colleagues in my clinic providing this letter? Well, to answer that specific question, I want to bring Eric um, back onto the webinar so he can talk about Crohn's and Clays Canada's new recommend recommendations on COVID-19 vaccine in patients with IBD. That's great. Thank you, Gil. And I will just share my screen. Let me just, there we go. And put up some, a few slides. So we wanna to get to all of your questions. There are some already coming in. We appreciate them. Uh, but I wanna quickly run through the new Crohn's and Colitis Canada Task Force recommendations on the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, and I, you know, many of you attended the webinar back in December and the guidelines, I think, were 
somewhat unclear at the time, and and our discussion was somewhat opaque, I guess. Uh, you know, and we certainly heard your feedback that there wasn't a clear recommendation whether or not to get the vaccine. And part of that was because of the guidelines that were coming out of the federal government and the National Advisory Committee on Immunizations, NACI, were also somewhat unclear. Uh, and I'll show you what's changed since then. But since that time that we had the last webinar, a lot has happened. Uh, firstly, obviously, the, the two brands of mRNA vaccines are now available, Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna vaccines. Both are mRNA vaccines. The CDC made recommendations about vaccinations in the US. Uh, the Canadian Association of Gastroenterology put out a communique to its members, uh, physician gastroenterologists primarily, to advise about the vaccine. The International Organization for the Study of IBD met and released recommendations after a consensus meeting, and then there was a change to the NASI recommendation. So I want to go through these very quickly before we get to the Crohn's and Colitis Canada recommendations for you, because they really set into context why we decided certain things. So firstly, with the CDC in the United States, uh, it did say that immunocompromised persons may be at risk for severe COVID-19. They don't mention IBD specifically, but immunocompromised people in general, and that immunocompromised people can be given the vaccine as long as they're counseled that there's really an unknown safety profile, because as Gil mentioned, immunocompromised people were not included in the clinical trials for either Pfizer or Moderna. And so we don't really know how well the vaccine works or whether there might be any sort of safety signal. However, the CDC really stated there's no biologic reason why there would be an increased risk of adverse effects in immunocompromised people, and therefore they do recommend vaccination. And they don't recommend revaccination at this point once you become you know, immunocompetent. So an for an example is if you're on steroids and you come off of them and you're only on a 5-ASA medication, not an immunosuppressing medication, at this point, they're not saying to get revaccinated. And they're not saying, they, they're saying that we should not be testing for antibodies because antibodies are not the only way that the vaccines work to confer immunity. Uh, similarly, the CDC recommended with autoimmune conditions, very similar things that they may, people with autoimmune conditions may get the vaccine. Uh, there are some data, there are some patients included in the trials that had autoimmune diseases not necessarily IBD, but other diseases like thyroid or diabetes. And there didn't appear to be anything weird in the trial in those patients. There were no imbalances uh, or weird outcomes in those patients, but the data weren't you know, large enough to be able to say whether or not there's a difference between autoimmune conditions and not. The Canadian Association of Gastroenterology recently published their recommendation, and that was based on a very rigorous review of the available evidence of trials in uh, mRNA vaccines for COVID-19. Uh, they do state that the trials excluded immunocompromised people, people who are on immunosuppressive medications. Uh, however, despite this, they recommended, they endorsed what the CDC said, which essentially recommended mRNA vaccines in special populations who are immunocompromised. And more specifically for IBD patients, they said that in patients on, with IBD not on immunosuppressive therapy, we recommend the COVID-19 vaccine be given. And remember the website, if you remember the, the guidance documents on our COVID-19 website, cronesandclitis.ca slash COVID-19, if you go to guidance, there's information on what medications are immunosuppressive if you're not sure if you're on one or not. So they do recommend it in IBD patients who are not immunosuppressed. And in IBD patients who are immunosuppressed, they suggested it. And those are different words used very much on purpose. It's based on the strength of the evidence to support the COVID-19 vaccine. So CAG is suggesting it because there are really no clear evidence, there's no clear science to say whether it works as well in immunosuppressed pa patients. And there's really no evidence to say about safety, although there's, again, no biologic reason at this point to make us think that it's unsafe. And then finally, the International Organization for the Study of IBD, IOIBD, released their, their uh, guidance document just this week. And this was a consensus group. It's called a Delphi consensus group, where a, a large number of doctors meet around the table, review the evidence, and decide, based on consensus, whether or not to recommend the vaccine. And essentially, the conclusion was that all IBD patients should get the vaccine at their earliest available opportunity. While they didn't find evidence that IBD patients should be prioritized just because they have IBD, 
they do say that they should be in the same groups as everybody else. So if you're an IBD patient who is a healthcare provider, you should be given the vaccine with healthcare providers. If you're an IBD patient who's elderly uh, with a cardiac condition, you should be given at the same time as that. The reason they didn't prioritize IBD patients or recommend prioritization is because really so far the evidence is showing that IBD patients do generally as well as the general population who get COVID-19, unless you're on steroids. Uh, otherwise, IBD patients tend to do quite well when they get COVID-19 if they're young and healthy. And obviously, age and cardiac disease and diabetes and hypertension are risk factors for bad outcomes, even in IBD patients. And then let's talk about the, the, the Canadian guidelines from the National Advisory Committee for Immunizations. These were the old guidelines that came out around the time that Gil and I gave the last webinar. And basically it said, don't give the COVID-19. We recommend against giving the COVID or routinely offering the COVID-19 uh, vaccination to immunocompromised patients. However, after discussion with your healthcare provider, if people feel that the risk outweighs the benefit, you know, or rather the benefit of getting the vaccine outweighs the risk of any vaccine outcomes, you can still give it, you can still offer it to immunocompromised patients. Similarly with autoimmune conditions, very similar recommendations that you have, you have the right to get it. You should get it if you have a discussion with your healthcare provider and you find that your risks outweigh uh, your benefits. However, more recently, I think that NACI firstly heard from the public to say that really this wasn't completely clear. And secondly, we started to get stories that uh, particularly healthcare providers and elderly people in long-term care facilities were being refused the vaccine simply because they had IBD, even when they were not on immunocompromising medications. And so in, on January 12th, NACI recommended new guidelines that said immunocompromised patients and persons with autoimmune diseases should be offered a complete series of COVID-19 vaccine, as long as there's a discussion with a healthcare provider and a risk assessment of the patient deems that the benefits of getting the vaccine outweighs the risk, the, the really the absence of evidence about safety and efficacy of the vaccine in these populations. So they are recommending it. However, I think the bottom line here is if you can stay home, you may want to wait for more evidence to find out if uh, you should get the vaccine or not. So that's really all the information that's colored our immunization uh, recommendations. And you can get the uh, recommendations and uh, frequently asked questions as well on our webpage at crohnsandclitis.ca slash COVID-19. If you click on vaccines right at the top, or you can go to that direct website uh, as well. And you know the background of our statement was that there's really no evidence yet for mRNA vaccines, either efficacy or safety in IBD patients, not quite yet. However, excluding IBD patients really doesn't go along with the concept of equity that we, and universality that is really important to the Canadian healthcare system and to justice and ethics for healthcare in Canada. Uh, we feel that probably the benefits of getting the vaccine outweighs the risk, and there may be a decreased immune response to the vaccine, particularly in people who are immunosuppressed with medications. However, this is not a reason to exclude IBD patients from getting the vaccine. In addition, we acknowledge that not getting the vaccine may cause additional emotional and psychological stress because you're worried about get, getting COVID-19, particularly if you live in a high prevalence area or you have to go to work and you're, you're, uh, you meet with the public on a regular basis. So our recommendations were that a diagnosis of IBD should not be a reason to exclude people with IBD from getting vaccines. People uh, who should be prioritized to get the vaccines should not be deprioritized because they have IBD. So again, if you're a healthcare provider, whether or not you should have you have IBD, you should still get the vaccine with healthcare providers. There should be a discussion. You should discuss with your doctor, uh, whether it's your gastroenterologist or your primary care provider, about the risks and the benefits of getting the vaccine in, in terms of making an informed choice. You should discuss safety and effectiveness of the vaccines, both in the general population and the lack of evidence with uh, IBD. And then the, like, the risk, you know, the balance between contracting COVID-19 and having complications, as well as uh, the, you know, the risk of staying home. So essentially, this decision that you have to make really should balance how high is the prevalence of COVID-19 in your local community. So that determines how likely you are to get it, obviously. Occupational risk factors, so are you a teacher, are you a doctor, are you a nurse, uh, 
Uh, do you work in a long-term care home? Those would be at-risk groups who should consider getting the vaccine. And then personal risk factors and comorbidities, right? So if you're a 20-year-old, otherwise completely healthy, able to stay home, you may want to consider waiting until there's more evidence about safety and efficacy of the vaccine in your, your group and in IBD patients. Whereas if you're 75, have cardiac disease and hypertension, you may consider getting the vaccine because your risk is, is higher than the general population of having complications from COVID-19. So with that, uh, I'm going to invite the panel on and introduce the panel as well. And I'll stop, yeah, I've stopped sharing my screen, thank you. So if everybody can turn on their webcams and their mics. So the panel today should be familiar to our regular viewers of the COVID-19 webinars. Dr. Cynthia Xiao, who's a pregnancy and IBD specialist and an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at, at, in, at the University of Calgary. And Dr. Charles Bernstein, who's a distinguished professor of medicine and a gastroenterologist uh, and the, the Bingham Chair in Gastroenterology Research at the University of Man Manitoba. And Dr. Bernstein is also a member of our Crohn's and Colitis Canada IBD and COVID-19 Task Force. So thank you, Cynthia and Charles, for joining us. And we will start with some questions. Yeah. And, and again, I just want to thank both Cynthia and Charles as well. Um, and just to let the audience know that um, we, we've got some questions that were based on when you registered, you asked us questions. So we tried to answer many of those questions in the two presentations that Eric and I did. Um, we've left several of them for the discussion that we're about to have. And we have no more presentations, really just um, questions and answers. And we already are seeing questions being posted. Some of the questions that, that you're posting, well, hopefully they'll get answered as part of this, um, this dialogue. Um, but ones that we see that we haven't seen before, we'll try to get in before, before the end of the webinar. Um, so I just want, maybe I'll start, um, Charles, with you is, um, you know, when we're thinking about um, the risk benefit analysis, it really comes down to, you know, the risk of COVID-19 and somebody with having inflammatory bowel disease against the, the vaccine. And really with the vaccine, it's about being an understudy population. It's the fact that patients with IBD weren't included in the randomized control studies. So we don't have, you know, a really well documented detail. So a lot of information that we're doing is extrapolating from um, other um, vaccines or what we know about the current uh, COVID vaccines in, in non-IVD patients. And so what I wanted to just start with, with for you is just to ask you, the question we're seeing here is what is the impact of COVID-19 in people with IBD? And just to give us a sense of how COVID impacts people both from a physical perspective, but also um, even from a mental health perspective, um, just so we get a sense of the risk of COVID-19 when, when people are trying to make this decision. Oh, and I think that you're muted. No, still muted. Okay, I think. Um, can can oh, you hear me now? Yes, yes. you can. Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> so uh, thanks, Gil, and thanks, Gil and Eric, again, for leading this endeavor for the whole year. You've really done an extraordinary uh, job. Um, all year, uh, and I know uh, CCC is grateful, and uh, the community of IBD and uh, IBD healthcare providers are grateful. You guys have done an amazing job. So um, I can go now, right? You, you wanted me to, to advertise. Oh, uh, okay. We'll get your money. So you were your checks in the mail. Yeah, you were asking me about the impact of um, COVID-19 on IBD, and and I think that. IBD patients are like the rest of the world. We're all struggling. And I, I don't know whether patients with IBD or their families take any comfort in knowing that for, for once, really, they're really part of a global uh, struggle and not just their own IBD-related struggle. Um, the question then is, is there anything added because you have IBD or because you have rheumatoid arthritis or because you have multiple sclerosis or because you have congestive heart failure and you're somebody with a chronic disease. Firstly, I want to say that one misconception that patients with IBD commonly have had is that because they have IBD, by definition, they're immunosuppressed. By definition, having this IBD or immune disease, they're going to be more susceptible to COVID-19. And I had a lot of patients who were in a very deep remission and wanted to not work because they were afraid of going out in the public. And the fact is, is that 
if you have inflammatory bowel disease and you are in a deep remission, and especially if you're not on medications at all, um, you're not immunosuppressed just because you have IBD. So that's an important thing to know. Now, if you have IBD and you're on medications, you're not necessarily immunosuppressed if you're using some medications like 5-ASA, which is a non-immunosuppressive medication, or if you're using some enemas as your therapy if you have ulcerative colitis. Now, if you're using Imuran or 6 mercaptopurine or you're using a biologic drug, they are immunomodulating. Sometimes I don't like to use the word, su word suppressing uh, because they may not necessarily, some of our drugs may not necessarily suppress. Some do, but they modulate your immune system. And that may put you at a certain risk for acquiring any infection, including COVID-19. So from a physical perspective, if you're on biologic medications, um, there is the potential risk that you may be at a higher risk than the general population. If you're chronically on steroids like prednisone, and it's the minority of patients, maybe three or five percent that might be, that might put you at an increased risk and also an increased risk for not doing as well. If you do acquire COVID-19 and you are on a biologic medication, um, we have no evidence that you're going to do worse. So the fact that you're on a biologic medication and the fact that you've had this immunomodulation, if you acquire COVID-19, you're as likely to do well or not as well as your neighbors or your colleagues in the, in the general community who, who aren't using those medicines. And that data come from the secure registry that Gil and Eric have alluded to. And Gil is a, 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 an active uh, co-investigator. And, and so they've really provided us information as best as we can get. It's not perfect. We're going to know better in a year or two years or three years from now what really happened. But now they have data up to 4,000 people. So we're getting a good feel that being on biologic medications doesn't necessarily, in fact, it's not only not necessarily, people don't do worse. There's even been a signal that being on certain biologic medications, like the anti-TNF drugs, like infliximab, like Humira, you can actually do better. And the rationale for that is the, the, what really kills people or makes people very sick is they get this massive inflammatory reaction in their lungs and it's called a cytokine storm, and the anti-TNF can actually block a limb of that. So the bottom line of that long ramble is that if you have IBD and you're not on medicine or you're on mild medicine like 5-ASA, you're at absolutely no increased risk of getting COVID-19 or doing worse with COVID-19. If you have IBD and you're on a biologic medication, you're at no increased risk of getting COVID-19, you're at no increased risk of doing worse with it, but we don't really know for sure. You may be at a slight increased risk, but we don't think that you're going to do worse. And if you have IBD and you're on chronic steroids, you may be at an increased risk of getting COVID-19, and you may be at an increased risk of doing worse. So we need to be careful for that population especially. Now, the second part of, of, the, of thinking of a patient holistically is the impact of having a chronic disease and worrying about COVID-19. And unquestionably, we know from lots of data Canada and around the world, that mental health disorders have increased during this COVID-19 pandemic. And for obvious reason, people with a chronic disease are more anxious about how this is all going to unfold. So I think this is a time to especially be, uh, to pay attention and be cognizant of where your mental health is at and get help for your mental health. Uh, it's, you're, you're part of a, a whole global community that is sharing this worry, this anxiety, and an increased stress over what's gonna happen if I get COVID-19. And that's gonna lead into how so very important it is for you to get vaccinated. Yeah, that was excellent. And just to give the audience a bit of context where a lot of the data that Dr. Bernstein was just talking about came from. So back on March 12th, um, Eric and I were the, the co-chairs, we struck the co-chairs for the Crohn's and Clays Canada's COVID IBD task force. Charles has been a member on that task force since um, March 12th. Uh, we've got adult pediatric gastroenterologists, infectious disease specialists, nurses, patients from all across the country that are, are sitting on that committee. 
back in the beginning of March, there was zero data on the impact of COVID and IBD. So everything we did was based on extrapolating from what we know in, in other settings. Um, the IBD secure registry was just, just um, um, coming up. Like I said, on March 19th, we were about 21 patients in the, in the database. There are now currently over 4,500 in the database. And each one of those IBD patients is unique in the types of drugs they are, their age, all the different risk factors that we've been exploring. And with those huge numbers, we can look to see who has done poorly. And by that meaning that they need to go into hospital and intensive care or even passed away from COVID-19 versus those who've actually recovered from COVID and never were sick enough to need to, to go to hospital. And that's where we can start to look at that data and, and it starts to help us identify those risk factors. And just, just to summarize from what Charles said, age is the, is the number one risk factor. The older you are, the more likely a bad outcome can occur. Um, having active disease, particularly if you need to have use prednisone, that's another potential risk factor for, for bad outcomes. But if you're in remission on a therapy, whether it's a biologic or an immunomodulator, um, that we don't see a signal for, for worse. And, and we're always, our big message is to stay on, on medication because if you stop them and you flared and then you got COVID, the risk is actually much higher. Um, so, so just wanted to highlight a few of those points. I just have a follow-up question for Dr. Bernstein. I'm trying to integrate some of the questions that we're getting live in the chat as well. Uh, one question came in, you mentioned, you know, being on no medication is probably okay. What about J-pouch, ostomy? Any evidence that there's a problem with those, with patients who have a J-pouch and ostomy who are on no medications? Evidence in terms of acquiring COVID-19 or doing worse when they get COVID-19? Yes. So to the best of my knowledge, there's no evidence for either situation, either an ostomy or a J pouch. And quite frankly, medically, or I can't think of a medically rational reason why they would necessarily do worse uh, or either be more susceptible, uh, even though, you know, maybe messy to have a, an ostomy at times um, and a J pouch, you may go to the bathroom more, but it is still predominantly a respiratory borne illness. Uh, we're careful about hand washing and touching surfaces, et cetera. But I, I think the experts, and I'm no expert, but I think the experts still believe that respiratory transmission is the primary transmission mode. And, um, you know, there's no reason why anybody with a pouch or ostomy would be at increased risk. Yeah, the only thing that I can think of is that COVID can cause diarrhea as one of the symptoms, sort of not the major symptom of the disease, but it certainly can be. So just like any other virus, you have to make sure you keep hydrated if you're having diarrhea uh, with an ostomy particularly. But otherwise, one, yeah. One final, point, uh, one final point that I would make for the IBD community is that um, many of you who may be watching today may have had COVID. Many of you may be, um, have never had COVID but that you know of, but you may really have had COVID and sailed right through didn't even know you had it, had asymptomatic COVID, like many people in the population do. So we're not really going to know whether the IBD community did any worse or possibly even any better. And one of the reasons why you may even do better is almost a sociological one, in the sense that you're in tune with being a patient, you're in tune with following you know, medications and, and recommendations. And so perhaps you've been following along the recommendations and staying safe and safer than the general population. But it's possible um, that in two or three years from now, when we do serologic studies to understand who's formed antibodies, we're going to find a vast number of IBD patients that had COVID-19 and never knew they had it, that they were asymptomatic, just like the general population. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so let's pivot now to vaccines, because that's why everybody's here. So, Cynthia, I'd like to ask you a question, just your general view on things. Uh, do you consider vaccines safe and effective in people with IBD? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you again, um, Gil and Eric, for the invitation. So, when we talk about vaccines, um, absolutely right. The, the two main issues that we discuss are the efficacy. So, do the vaccines work in general for patients with IBD? And they absolutely do. The second thing that we often talk about that many patients would have heard of is um, do the patients develop an adequate immune response, we call that immunogenicity, and I just describe that usually as does the vaccine stick and does it work? And then the third aspect is the safety of the vaccine. So I think in general, 
Are vaccines safe and effective for patients with IBD? They absolutely are. And we do recommend that um, all IBD patients are considered for the same vaccines as the general population. Um, so that might include anything from the annual influenza vaccine to um, hepatitis vaccines to travel vaccines. The only caveat is that for patients who are on biologic agents or who are immunocompromised, they shouldn't be receiving a live vaccine. But the vast majority of vaccines are non-live. And the, the currently available COVID vaccines are not alive. They're mRNA vaccines. There's no live component to it. There are vaccines for COVID-19 under trial, right, that are, uh, I believe, adenovirus, live adenovirus vectors, but those are not available at this point. Mm -hmm. And Cynthia, if I could just uh, follow up, one of the questions we got from the audience was, why were individuals with inflammatory bowel disease or immunosuppressed individuals um, excluded from the randomized control studies. And I just wanted to give, and one of the, the reasons for that was because vaccine studies, there's a concern that there potentially could be a blunted immune response with, from a vaccine. And so thinking about not necessarily the COVID vaccines, because we don't have a lot of data um, in COVID vaccines, but for other vaccine studies, um, what, what is the, the immune response for being vaccinated in, um, in, for other vaccines like influenza, pneumonia, shingles, and so on? Yeah. So um, in general, um, IBD patients are like the general, uh, like everybody else. The vaccines do work. Um, the IBD in itself doesn't reduce the immune response. However, if patients are on um, immunomodulators or on biologics or high doses of steroids, they might not be able to mount such a significant response. So when we talk about general vaccines, that's why we always advise patients if they're going to have for example, a biologic workup, an immunomodulator workup, that they get the vaccines um, administered prior to starting on the medications to give them the best um, chance of responding to those vaccines and having a really good response. Having said that, if a patient is already on a um, immunosuppressant or a biologic, as long as that vaccine is not live, patients should still have it. It's better to have some response than to have no response. So patients should not be avoiding vaccinations, only with the exception that they shouldn't receive the live vaccinations if they're immunosuppressed. Yeah, and, and again, in this and in randomized control studies, you're always trying to get the best data from the virus. So the original, original randomized control studies that were run in the summer of 2020, they, they just want to know, does the vaccine work or not? And so if they included people who could potentially blunt that a, a bit of immune response, it would be confounded. Um, and so that's why they excluded those individuals, uh, not because they expect there was a specific concern or that there, it wouldn't work in those populations. It's just that they want the, the best data for, the, for those trials. Now, there was a question in the audience is, should you stop your medications before getting the vaccine to optimize your, your response? And maybe, maybe Charles, just if you wanted to just allude to that, because we were talking earlier about risk factors for COVID and what could happen if you stopped your medication. So I just wanted to mind just addressing that specific question from the audience. Yeah, you absolutely should not stop your medications. Um, we were worried that if you stop your medications, you could flare with your IBD. And we don't want that to happen. You don't want to get sick with your IBD. You don't want to have to be confronted by COVID while your IBD is sick, whereas your IBD previously was you know, quiescent or, or at least at a minimal level. So first principles, we don't want you to stop your medications. Second comment I would say is that if you're through a, a steroid um, cycle, for whatever reason, you and your doctor have decided that it was necessary to give you either a modest or higher dose steroids to start tapering down, then stay home. Um, you know, don't be out there in public. Uh, avoid physical contact, you know, avoid certain situations. And, you know, that may be a scenario where if you're really working out in the public, if you're really a healthcare provider and you're needing to go on 40 milligrams of prednisone, that's time to stay home from work and, and, and be away from the possibility of contracting COVID. And then as you taper down on your prednisone, exactly what Cynthia was saying, that steroids are, are you know, one drug that um, may blunt your response, but um, but we know that as opposed to 
changing your infliximab dose, steroids are going to be tapered down. The goal is to get you on a lower dose so that when you're really on a low dose of prednisone or off, uh, that may be the time to get vaccinated. Now, one point, and I've seen this in the chat, and it's a question that's come up in my clinic, is patients have asked that um, they're on a biologic and should they time their vaccine with the timing of the biologic? They're getting infliximab every six weeks. Should they get the biologic, should they get the vaccine at the end of that six weeks before they're ready for their next dose? Or um, any, 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 go through any cycle, you're every four weeks of betalizumab, every two weeks of uh, adalimumab. Now, I don't have data to support what I'm going to say, and I'll be interested to hear what our other three panelists say about this. But my recommendation is to not time uh, the, uh, your vaccine with your dosing. The reason I say that is because while if, let's say you're getting infliximab, and let's say your level at, at baseline of infliximab is the number 11, it is possible that four weeks earlier or six weeks earlier, your number of infliximab in your blood was 22. You had a higher level earlier on and the level was a little bit lower. But we believe that we're aiming that with any of these drugs for you to have a consistent level that's good enough to modulate your immune system to keep your Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis tamped down. And therefore, I would suspect that any time in your interval that um, you should have good circulating levels. And I think it can get complicated when you start to want try to time vaccine. So in other words, you're going to time the vaccine in that sixth week before your infliximab, but then the vaccine starting to rev up and starting to work even better one week later. And now you're going to get your big infusion of infliximab one week later. Uh, so the actual timing of when you're maximally making antibodies is actually not perfectly known. And so I think you could run into trouble timing something on either end. So I personally have not been, rec I've been advocating for all my patients to get vaccine, um, unless of course they're on modest to high doses of steroids. I think there is a timing issue, but for everybody else, I'm not recommending they time. We have a website in Manitoba called ibdmanitoba.org. Um, there's lots of information about IBD there. There's two big boxes on the front page when you open it up. The first box was IBD patients should not stop their medications. Then we move that box to the side. IBD patients should get their vaccine. So I, I do feel strongly about that. But I'm, I'm a non-timer, and I'd be interested to hear what you guys say. We actually looked at that question, and I think I alluded to it when we reviewed the immunization guidelines that are coming out from the Canadian Association of Gastroenterology. We looked at that question when it came to other vaccines, because this was pre-COVID that we did all this work, uh, particularly the flu vaccine, because it's a, a question that keeps coming up when you get a yearly flu vaccine. And there was really no evidence to say that you should time it in any specific way. And in fact, there were small studies in rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, there was one study that said it should be done right before your infusion and one study that said it should be done in the midway through your infusion and they both showed similar results you know it really was not consistent in those two studies and so in the guidelines we actually specifically said there's no evidence to say that you should time it at a certain time in, in the midst of your infusions and i think that it's it becomes really difficult when you're talking about a vaccine that should be given three or four weeks apart right because I'm not really sure how you time that without holding a dose, and we certainly don't recommend holding a dose. All right. So, um, actually, just before we um, go on to, to this question, um, one of the things that I've saw quite a few um, questions in relationship to pregnancy and breastfeeding and, and safety of the vaccine, and, and Cynthia, you like. You're a world expert on pregnancy and inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and uh, when we were allowed to travel across the world, you were traveling everywhere to, to educate gastroenterologists like myself. Um, and I, I just want to, if you want to let the like, pregnant women were in the same boat as immunocompromised um, individuals back in December, I just want you to kind of talk, talk to us about what's changed from the obstetrics perspective and how that has uh, impacted pregnant women with IBD. Yeah, so um, that's a great question because we certainly know that, you know, pregnant women are obviously very worried about um, COVID. And even though the majority of pregnant women who 
will who do get COVID have a mild to moderate presentation, the risk of complications is much higher. So if you compare a pregnant woman with COVID versus um, a, a, another woman who's the same age but is not pregnant, the risk of being hospitalized of going to ICU is over one and a half times and the risk of requiring um, mechanical ventilation if they are that unfortunate is almost twofold. And so again, while the majority will have mild um, only moderate symptoms, if you are unfortunate and you get a severe case of COVID, then there are bad implications both for the mum as well as for the baby. And we certainly have seen with um, a number of COVID pregnancy registries, there's quite a lot of them around. People will see that there's CAN COVID, there's COVID preg, there is ERPSEC, there's a lot of um, data around the world. But within Canada itself, the data so far has demonstrated that there's approximately a two times risk of having a preterm birth. So babies who are born before 37 weeks are less able to withstand sort of the stresses of the outside world and are more at risk of developing um, any sorts of infections or neurodevelopmental problems. So with all of that in mind, we really feel that the pregnant women are a more vulnerable population, similarly um, to patients who are immune um, suppressed. And so the Society of Obstetrics and Gynecology in Canada, the SOGC, has made similar recommendations and made a change in their recommendations such as NASI did to say that at first, even though they recommended against vaccinating pregnant women because the data wasn't there, that we should be considering pregnant women as a vulnerable group and we should be giving them priority for vaccination because of the bad outcomes that can happen for both mum and baby. And what about breastfeeding women, Cynthia? Do you know about what the recommendations are for them? Yeah, they, they are recommending that um, pregnant, I mean, sorry, breastfeeding women do also receive the vaccine. I mean, obviously the stresses when you uh, when um, a woman is postpartum are not exactly the same as when they're pregnant. For example, you know, with women who are pregnant, as they get later in the pregnancy, you know, they might feel a little bit more short of breath just because of the baby being in the way and preventing them, you know, taking big breaths and so they feel more uncomfortable. That's not an issue postpartum, but from a safety perspective, um, you know, we would recommend that both pregnant as well as um, lactating um, or breastfeeding women do receive the vaccine and that is being continued to be um, studied at the moment. And Eric lots of questions about children what do we know about children with the vaccines and where do they fall in 2021? So right now the two vaccines that we have in Canada the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine are not approved for use in younger children the trials of the Pfizer vaccine included children, uh, sorry, included people 16 years of age and older, and the Moderna vaccine trials included people 18 years of age and older. Both of the companies are now running trials in children around the world uh, up to, uh, as young as 12 years old, I believe, is the last trial that I saw. Uh, but those results probably won't be out, you know, perhaps not until the summertime. So I suspect that at the moment, children will not uh, be eligible to get the, the vaccine, uh, the standard child who's otherwise healthy. And again, remember that, you know, children who get COVID-19 do extremely well, in including children with, with IBD who are on immunosuppressive medications and biologics. They tend to do extremely well in the secure registry. Very few of them needed hospitalization at all, and almost none of them needed to be admitted to the ICU. So really, really good outcomes in children with IBD who get COVID-19. Um, that being said, NASI did allow for some leeway there to say that if you have a child with very complex medical needs, and, and particularly you can have children who have risk factors for severe COVID-19, like children with lung disease, severe lung disease, children with cardiac disease, uh, those children after a discussion with their pediatrician may be eligible to receive the vaccine, but that's certainly not the majority of the children with IBD that we see. So for the time being, uh, it will be that children are not eligible, but we'll have more data soon, I'm sure. Eric, can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. So this unusual syndrome in kids that's been reported and widely seen of a sort of a diffuse uh, uh, syndrome that's been seen with other uh, conditions, uh, other viral conditions in the past, but that affects uh, a multi-organ system, so that, that's, uh, even though kids are, you know, live from that and, and come out of it okay, uh, 
Um, that is a dreadful condition. And uh, is there any evidence that kids with IBD are at any more, or kids with any chronic immune condition are at any more or any different risk of getting that entity and A and B, uh, that entity alone, would that make us want to vaccinate kids once we're sort of done everyone over 16 or 18 or not? So yeah, what you're speaking of is the multi-system inflammatory syndrome associated with COVID or MISC. Uh, and it, it is a very serious condition, but a very, very rare condition. Very few cases appear in children, although obviously the more cases of COVID you get in children, the more likely you are to see some cases with MISC. Um, you know, and the bottom line is we don't know about the effect of IBD or other immune mediated inflammatory diseases and whether it might increase your risk of, of developing that. In general, um, you know, it's it's sort of similar to a disease called Kawasaki disease. It's not exactly the same. And the numbers that we're seeing, uh, so we actually did a study, it's not published yet, but this is sort of hot off the press, looking at whether people with Kawasaki disease, children who get Kawasaki disease, are more likely to get immune-mediated inflammatory diseases later. And in general, they were not, with the exception of arthritis. So there didn't seem to be an association between IBD and Kawasaki disease. Now, again, MISC may be something completely different. We just don't know. Um, you know, I think eventually we will want our children vaccinated, especially if it's shown, if the companies are able to show that being vaccinated prevents transmission, right? So right now we're saying vaccines prevent getting COVID-19, getting the disease, but we don't know whether it makes people less likely to transmit the disease to others. And obviously in children who are around each other all the time and confined spaces and schools and so on, they may be transmitting the disease, uh, you know, at least older children at a similar rate to adults. And so you're gonna wanna prevent transmission. But children are not little adults. Uh, that's the mantra of, of pediatricians everywhere. And their immune systems are not the same thing as adults. And therefore, we really want to make sure that the vaccines are effective in children and that they're safe in children as well. So I think it'll take a little bit of time to get those that information before deciding whether or not we're vaccinating. Can I ask Cynthia a question? Um, Cynthia, I may have been just mesmerized by looking at Gil and Eric for so long, and you may have said this, but um, would you time uh, during the pregnancy, whether a woman had COVID or uh, whether a woman had IBD or not, would you time when in pregnancy you'd give the vaccine? Okay. Yeah, that, that actually hasn't been um, studied, but I think the, the SOGC um, recommendations are that if a pregnant woman is able to get the vaccine, to just give it whenever the, they can. So I guess it's very similar to how the International Organization of IBD states that you know if, if an IBD patient can get the vaccine, they should get it, no matter when the timing is during an infusion cycle or when the trimester is in pregnancy. The, um, the studies have not um, clearly demonstrated whether there's better immunogenicity and uptake of the vaccine in the different trimesters yet. And, and one thing I would add to that is that, I mean, right now, if people who are eligible for the vaccine, it's either because they're high risk of exposure or at high risk of complication, or they're, they're doing work that their people that they're caring for are at high risk for complications. And so really, I think that the big push, and I think this is where you're seeing kind of unity around these guidelines, is all around, um, you know, if you have access to the vaccine, be, be vaccinated, whether you're pregnant with your IBD and so on. Um, now, most of us are gonna wait. Um, most of the people in the audience here are, are gonna wait for a few months, but in the context of being waited through that prioritization sequence, time is gonna pass, millions more people are gonna be vaccinated, tons of more data is going to come out, including data in the IBD population. Uh, and that's going to help us um, answer your questions a, a lot more precisely um, and will help kind of guide, you know, the approaches. Just like things we were saying today were slightly different from what we said on December 17th, in two to three months from now, it, it may be a different dialogue as well. So that that's the key. The key is that we're here continuously updating this information. Tons of research are coming out um, and, we'll, um, um, and we'll share that information with you. Um, and question for, for you, um, Charles, um, one of the concerns that people have raised is, could a vaccine trigger a flare of IBD? I just wanna get a, a sense from your perspective, um, you know, what, what do you think about this question? 
not to, I think, any of our knowledge, certainly not to my knowledge. And you folks have already alluded to getting flu vaccines and getting Shingrix, the shingles vaccine, the pneumovax, even though this is, and Gil showed us a little bit of the science that being an mRNA vaccine is a little bit different than something we've used before. There's no scientific rationale why this should trigger a flare of IBD. And Cynthia, from previous vaccine studies, is there any concerns about, about flares being triggered from vaccines, like in, in, in other vaccines, influenza, for example, or pneumonia vaccine? No, the good news is that it has not been demonstrated to increase flare. And, I think and the one thing, thing that people get concerned about is that um, obviously with any vaccine you can get non-specific symptoms. Um, as you've mentioned before, you know, patients can get, you know, muscle aches, headaches or nausea, but um, those are vaccine-specific side effects rather than um, related to the uh, flare of the IBD in itself. Yeah, and there there is um, what people talk about in the vaccine literature as vaccine enhanced diseases, where there's some theoretical risk of of certain conditions. Probably the, the earliest one that we recognized was Guillain-Barré syndrome, which was a, a neurological disorder um, that that people have, have connected. And so there actually are large registries for the COVID uh, vaccine that are happening internationally to explore these these um, implications. Um, but the one thing I would just say about about an IBD flare, um, we've actually at University of Calgary have started a COVID IBD clinics who are actually seeing people who've had COVID and um, uh, are having IBD. It's, part, it's also part of a, a research initiative we're doing to actually look at antibodies to people who have had COVID and to look to see if they've, they've developed antibodies. And one of the things that I've always asked all my patients I've been seeing in this COVID IBD clinic is, you know, what happened when you got COVID? Um, what did you do with your medication? And most of them had to delay the medication. There were some that actually were in the mid cycle of their intubial infusion over eight weeks, and, and they actually were able to recover and get back onto intubial and never had a delay. Others were on a drug like Humira and they had to deposit for a few weeks. And many of them started developing symptoms. And so I would almost argue, think about the opposite direction, which is if you get COVID and then you have to stop your medication, you're, you're probably much more likely to flare in that setting than, than the vaccine itself triggering a flare. There's a, actually a good question in the chat that I think we should clarify because we're, we're four different gastroenterologists from three different provinces. I think it'll be great to hear the different provinces. But somebody asked whether uh, their, the patient asked whether their gastroenterologist would reach out to them about getting the COVID-19 vaccine when it was ready or whether they should contact somebody. And so I'll answer that for in Ontario. Uh, it's highly unlikely your gastroenterologist will reach out to you. The gastroenterologists tend not to give vaccines in their clinics in Ontario. And so right now, even family doctors are not being included in the vaccine strategy. Uh, right now, it's really specialized clinics that you're being booked because of your occupational risk or because you're a resident in a long-term care home. But uh, once the vaccines become available in family doctor's offices, it's much more likely that your family doctor will reach out to you or you may have to call your family doctor in order to book the vaccine. Uh, the gastroenterologists will probably not administer the vaccines, but we may be able to help uh, counsel you regarding and, and inform you regarding the risk of vaccines and the benefits for you. Agreed in Alberta, Manitoba as well, I assume? Yeah, our, the biggest challenge we've had at the, at, here in Calgary has been the confusion around the eligibility of vaccines. So we've had patients who are ICU nurses needing the vaccine, um, and then they're 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 asked if they're immunosuppressed, and they say yes. And then there's been a barrier, and the AHS policy has has evolved along with NACI policy to say that you know as long as you've had that discussion, well, but then all of a sudden now you need a, a discussion, and so that's why I kind of shared that letter um, earlier is because you know our our clinic and, and Cynthia's uh, in our clinic, she's actually on sabbatical, so so I'm I'm answering for for her because she's off doing sabbatical research, um, but um, but so University of Calgary's IBD clinic. We, we prepared something so that, you, you know, one, we can have a dialogue with any of our patients, plus if they need it, we've got something there for them to, to produce. Um, and, uh, and, and Charles, what about in, in Manitoba? The Doctors Manitoba just made a plea to the government. Doctors Manitoba for the community is, is sort of the doctors, quote unquote, union here in Manitoba. It's the group that represents us. And we made a plea to the government to have doctors involved not only are their gastroenterologists not involved, but as Eric alluded to, 
primary care physicians have not been involved. It's really been very government-run uh, vaccine centers. And to be honest, there's a rationale for doing this in an organized way. And I understand why the government would start in an organized way. It's not like flu vaccine that's ubiquitous and can be given in supermarkets and pharmacies and in malls and anywhere. So they have to have the strategy and there's a limited number of vaccines. Once it becomes a ton of vaccines available, I still believe that gastroenterologists won't be giving the vaccines. The truth is that most gastroenterologists are not administering Shingrix or flu vaccine, even as we're recommending it. Um, and so I think what you're going to get from your gastroenterologist is the support and reassurance that you should get vaccinated and hopefully a supportive letter if it's needed, like Gil and Cynthia have crafted in Calgary, um, that uh, I've been using a very simple, yes, this person should get a vaccine. I may plagiarize uh, the Calgary letter now because it looks very official and looks like it's gonna keep me out of jail or something. And um, and that's a bad place to be. You get a lot of COVID in jail. So I I, um, I, uh, I agree, Eric. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't and I, I, to be honest, I think, it's really not in the domain of subspecialists to be administering these vaccines. Um, I think there has to be a, a different way. That's great. So, you know, we're coming to the end of our time. Um, I think we, we addressed that issue. Have the vaccines for COVID-19 been studied in people with IBD? Unfortunately, not yet. I think that's the bottom line there. Uh, so let's talk about this. So we talked about the recommendations that Crohn's Colitis Canada has put out, and you can read about them on the website again. But I, I really want to get your personal opinions, uh, Charles, Cynthia, and Gil, as to whether you are recommending the COVID-19 vaccine for your patients with IBD. So maybe we'll start with uh, Gil. Yeah, and, and I just reiterate what I've said earlier is, right now, people who are eligible are people who are at risk either of exposure of complications. And so that risk-benefit analysis of, of not having clear data in IBD patients, it, it strongly weighs getting getting the vaccine. And so I'm strongly recommending the vaccine in that setting. Um, with time, other groups are gonna start to get access to the vaccine. Um, with that, we're also going to have more information for you. Um, and I, and I'm, I'm pretty confident that the recommendations that we'll have in a month from now, two months from now, or three months now, we still be consistent with what we're saying today, which is it's it's really important for you to be vaccinated. And Cynthia? Yeah, I would strongly recommend the vaccine, um, the COVID vaccine. Please remember that the current vaccines are non-live. So regardless of what type of IBD you have or what type of IBD medication you are on, it's safe. And if you are pregnant, it, the, you know, we um, are recommending it and the international societies are recommending now that pregnant women um, do receive the COVID vaccine. And then if you add the two together, if you have IBD and are pregnant, it is very difficult for an IBD patient to, you know, have to go through the trauma of having COVID, not to mention if you're pregnant as well, you know, this really impacts on the pregnancy. It also impacts on your ability to look after your child. So. Um, on all those accounts, I would strongly recommend it. All right, and Charles? Yes, full stop. Thank you, that was brief. Uh, I, I wanna make three final points before we wrap up. Um, I wanna say that number one, more data is emerging and we will have more data hopefully soon about COVID-19 vaccines in IBD. Somebody asked if Secure IBD was tracking this. Yes, they are. They are including a field, but there are many other organizations, including our own governments through health administrative data that are tracking who's getting the vaccine and will be able to assess outcomes. So more data are coming about safety and effectiveness of the vaccines in IBD patients. Uh, number two is please consider your risks and your benefits. And if you can stay home, if you can stay away from people, that's always the safer option, especially you know until most people can be vaccinated because vaccines are only 95% effective only. That's pretty good, but there's still a 5% risk if you're fully vaccinated that you could get COVID. And really, it won't be 100% until the entire population, or at least somewhere between 70 and 80%, are vaccinated and therefore herd immunity develops. So if you can stay home, wear a mask, do all of those things. And finally, don't forget that we're talking about risks and benefits, 
there's also risk to not getting the vaccine, right? It's not just the risk of the vaccine we're talking about here. You know, we're also talking about the risk of not getting the vaccine and getting COVID and having complications from COVID. And therefore, you have to consider that in your balance of whether vaccines are safe is also consider in your situation is not being vaccinated safe. And that has to go through your thought process when you're making that decision. So I think we'll end it here, if you're okay with that, everybody. I appreciate all of your time tonight. It's been very informative and I hope the audience has found it informative as well. Uh, I do want to ask the audience to please provide us with feedback. You should be getting a link with some feedback afterwards. And um, please let us know what you would like, what topics you would like covered over the following months. Uh, we are continuing to do these webinars on a monthly basis. And if new information develops, we may even do it more frequently than that. But so far, I think we've been uh, good with monthly. Weekly was pretty hard, eh? In the spring, Gil, it was, uh, it was pretty tiring to do a weekly webinar. But please provide us with feedback on what you would like to have covered. As usual, we'd like to thank all of the frontline workers, all of the people who, are, who have to go to work every day, who have to take care of you in terms of healthcare providers, but also who have to take care of you in terms of you know, grocery store workers and IT workers and the like. So thank you very much to all of you who are out there really, unfortunately, risking your lives in order to care for the, for the public. If you don't have to be out there, please don't go outside. And then finally, uh, please follow Crohn's and Colitis Canada on social media. You get more information from there. And I would like to once again make a plea, as I do at every webinar, just to let people know that you know this COVID pandemic has meant no in-person fundraising events for Crohn's and Colitis Canada, and that has resulted certainly in a hit to health charities in Canada, especially and including Crohn's and Colitis Canada. So if you are getting some value from these webinars, if you are getting uh, information that you find useful, please consider donating anything you can at Crohn'sandColitis.ca or you can text 20222 to, uh, to donate $25. You know, if you think about it, it's a meal really. And we hope that you're getting more than a value of a meal, uh, no pun intended to the fast food chains, but more than a value meal out of these webinars. So thank you everybody. And we look forward to seeing you again in February. I think the dates are coming up on the next slide, are they not? Uh, perhaps not. So. I'll just say that the next webinar is planned for February the 18th at the same time. So I hope everybody can join us on February the 18th for our next webinar. Thank you, everybody. Take care.